Good morning, and thank you for joining the Clinic and Associates' latest webinar, Midterms in Higher Education. What do the results mean for institutions? I don't know about you, but I'm finding it hard to believe Election Day was only one week ago today. I am also finding seven days of information and opinion to be somewhat overwhelming as we wait for final determination of who will control the House of Representatives. As part of our vision to help post-secondary institutions remain compliant with Title IV regulations so they can focus on changing their student, students' lives, our hope today is to help institutions understand what the final results are likely to mean for them. I can't think of anyone with a better combination of experiences to provide those insights than Jason Altmaier. Dr. Altmaier is president of Career Education Colleges and Universities, the national association representing private post-secondary career schools. He has previously been a senior executive for large companies in the healthcare industry, and from 2007 to 2013, served three ter terms in the United States Congress. In the House, Jason chaired a subcommittee, had 29 of his legislative initiatives signed into law, and introduced a bill that gained the most co-sponsors of any congressional bill in American history. He served on the Higher Education Subcommittee, where he was a leading supporter of the proprietary sector and was appointed to the conference committee that negotiated the final language of the Higher Education Act, the most recent time it was reauthorized. Today, he'll be discussing the outcomes of last week's elections and where Congress can be expected to focus in relation to higher education and the proprietary sector in particular. We are hoping to make today's webinar as interactive as possible. While Jason has prepared remarks for us, he wants to answer as many questions from the participants as possible. I encourage you to use the question feature in the webinar software to submit your questions. We will be actively organizing the questions and plan to address as many as possible. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jason Altmaier. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the discussion, and it is true. I, I'm, I'm going to give kind of a general overview of my thoughts on the election and what it looks like for higher education moving forward into the new Congress, but I really would like for this to not be a lecture, uh, certainly on Zoom, you know, just talking at you. I'd rather it be an interactive conversation, so please feel free to go through the chat and ask any questions that you have. Uh, stop me along the way if, if I say something that you want me to expand upon or, or talk in more detail about. So let, let's just make this an interactive discussion. And I, you know, I assume the people who I think probably who, who are tuning in and, and uh, being a part of this webinar today are people who are politically interested. I think it's fair to say you probably followed the election. You followed the aftermath pretty closely. I assume we all read the newspaper and, and watch the news shows. And, uh, you know, I'm going to try to not repeat things that I, I know others have said and, uh, you know, pontificate in, in a way that you've probably heard others do dozens of times over the past week. And just offer maybe some unique perspectives. And I would start by saying when I served in the House, it was 2007 to 2013, and I was part of two wave elections. I was a Democrat, I was a centrist Democrat, but I uh, was part of a Democratic wave that swept in a lot of Democrats, and I, I was part of a Republican wave that swept out 63 Democrats, the largest wave election since Herbert Hoover was president, 1928, uh, and I survived that, that wave uh, as a Democrat in a very difficult district, Republican-leaning district, and I say that because uh, I know what it's like going into an election when you see every every possible factor is against you or for you, right? I mean, you can see these waves coming. And I have to say, uh, you know, having been there, I never understood why the conventional wisdom was that this was going to be a red wave this year. Certainly uh, at CQ, you know, we benefit more uh, by Republican leadership. I think it's fair to say we worked very hard to support candidates. We supported Democratic candidates who are our friend and, and we have many allies in the Democratic Party. But by and large, we were not we would not have been disappointed to see the House and Senate flip. Let's put it that way, because the leadership on the education committees in both the House and the Senate have shown that they do not support the cause 
of proprietary education and, and they uh, want to exclude our students from opportunities in proprietary education. So I will say that. Uh, and uh, we, would, we would love to have seen an election that resulted in, in both chambers of Congress having new leadership and new vision and new thought on those issues. So uh, I, even though that's the outcome we were hoping for, I, I couldn't understand in the weeks leading up to the election why everyone assumed that this was going to be dozens of seats translating because having seen what it's like to be in a wave election on the ground, being part of those campaigns, running for office in, in a targeted national seat, uh, it just didn't seem like there was that same type of feel, that same type of momentum. And in fact, I saw a lot of momentum on the Democratic side. Uh, people point to the abortion issue. I, I think that's part of it, but I, I just think, and it's, again, I don't want to repeat what everybody has said now because it's self-evident, but uh, candidly, uh, and I'm not partisan in my remarks, but I think it's self-evident that the Trump brand is toxic in a general election. And the paradox that Republicans are going to have to face moving forward is that he still has clout in the primary election, clearly. And when he went in and endorsed these candidates, as everyone has now seen, uh, and I've been saying it for months, uh, really extraordinarily weak slate of candidates. I don't think I've ever seen worse candidates with the possible exception of, if you, may, you remember Christine O'Donnell in Delaware in 2010, Google that name when we're done. Uh, she, she was a Democrat, uh, or she, she, was, she was running in Delaware as a Republican in a Republican seat and uh, ran an extraordinarily poor campaign that resulted in Democratic Chris Coons being elected to a seat that everyone assumed was gonna be Republican. You know, there was that type of race, but it was in Pennsylvania, it was in Arizona, uh, certainly Georgia moving forward, Herschel Walker, great football player, incredibly great football player, not a great political candidate. And um, the fact that the Republicans moving forward are going to have to reconcile the fact that winning the primary and winning the general election are two different things. And I do think you're going to see that reconciliation occurring here over the next several weeks and, and months. And I have lived for the past, I served in Pennsylvania, but I've lived for the past 10 years in Florida. And I live in the district that Ron DeSantis represented as a congressman. Uh, worked with him, got to know him well, and uh, obviously now he's he's the governor here in Florida. Uh, it, 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 let me just say, it, it, I'll answer any questions people have, but uh, it's real. He he is a very very skilled political operator. He's been an enormously successful governor. He has large support on, among Democrats, um, you know, not majority support certainly, but it's not zero. Uh, you know, he got sixty percent of the vote or close to it uh, in a state that used to be a few years ago a toss-up considered a swing state. President Obama won Florida. And uh, the hype on Governor DeSantis is more than hype. It's real. And, and I think Democrats underestimate him at their peril. And you've seen these polls come out that say DeSantis, just today, uh, DeSantis would beat Trump by double digits in Iowa and New Hampshire certainly in Florida, where they both live, and uh, in other states. That's real. So I think Republicans are going to have to settle this for themselves on what they want to look like moving forward. But if they continue to put forward Trump-backed candidates that he endorses in the primary but are not in any way able to win in, an, in a targeted seat in a general election, it's going to be a big problem. And of course, next, next time is going to be a presidential election on top of that. So they're going to have to figure that out. But that's what you're going to see play out. And for Republicans, if they were to put forward multiple candidates as they did last time in 2016, remember they started with 17 candidates and in the end had a handful of very viable, strong, you know, sitting U.S. senators and, and others uh, that hung in for a long time. And Trump at that point uh, was able to just win 35% of the vote and, and win these primaries state by state. If they do that again, if Governor Hogan were to run in uh, who I admire in Maryland, uh, he was a former governor from Maryland, well, still a sitting governor, but he will soon be the former governor. 
uh, you know, certainly Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, uh, you know, these people who've looked at Nikki Haley, Tim, Senator Tim Scott. If folks like this, Governor Noam up in South Dakota, you know, if, if they were to get in the race and dilute the anti-Trump vote, that could all happen again. And he could win some of these states with 35 percent of the vote. But I do think if it's one on one, DeSantis versus Trump, I believe DeSantis will win. And I think Democrats underestimate him at their peril. A very skilled political operator. Not great interpersonally. You know, you go to these receptions. He's not a Bill Clinton type where you hear, you know, he just dominates the room when he walks in and, uh, you know, everybody knows he's there and he makes you feel like you're the only person in the ring. He's not, not great at that part of things, but in reading the political tea leaves and getting ahead of issues that are important to the public and showing leadership when it's called for, you know, in Florida, hurricanes, the way he handled COVID, uh, you know, very politically skilled operator. So I would expect big things from him and just say, from personal experience, the hype is is legitimate on him. I'll, I'll let you take a, the, take a pause so, because you're going through a lot. I don't have a new question, but I do want to give you uh, credit. And you, you mentioned, it. I feel like you were a fortune teller several months ago. You were the one person I heard expressing some pause about the the strength of the candidates that were put up in some of the key states and states that could have easily potentially been won by Republicans, but the the um, the candidates had some issues that were pretty easily attackable. I think I would say that made them tighter than they otherwise might have been. And you, at one point, you know, if not the lone voice, one of just a few people expressing some concerns, and we saw the results of that certainly a week ago. It's very clear in the congressional races and even in the governor races that it's you know Senate and governor that. The candidates that were backed by Trump and ran as kind of Trump style candidates, Dr. Oz, Masters in, in Arizona, uh, certainly Her Herschel Walker. Um, now, J.D. Vance was successful. Ohio is an overwhelmingly Republican state. And Tim Ryan ran an incredible campaign, um, made it close, but he would be the exception. But most of these folks, it, it, you know, the contrast is clear. The folks who ran you know, sort of traditional Republican campaigns, pro-business, anti-tax, conservative issues, they won. But the people who ran this sort of, uh, you know, they talk about the election denial and, and uh, you know, confrontational kind of bombastic Trump style campaign. Those are the candidates that lost. And it's very clear, well, the dichotomy that exists. So moving forward, they're going to have to figure that out. Right. But the Senate's going to be in Republican hands either 50 Democratic. 50 or 51. You're yeah, correct. I, yeah. I meant to say the House is going to be in Republican hands. The Senate is going to be in Democratic hands, 51 to 49 or 50 to 50. And that would be the vice president breaking the tie. So that is uh, going to impact judicial races, going to impact judges moving forward. Uh, the, the chair of the Higher Education Committee, the HELP Committee, it appears is going to be Senator Bernie Sanders, if you can believe that. So Patty Murray has not been a friend of the proprietary sector. We do not have a great relationship as a sector with her, although some of our schools in Washington do have a good relationship with her. Uh, she's She's been a um, little bit difficult to deal with from, from the perspective of allowing opportunity for our students and, and uh, not excluding our students from uh, using their their financial aid resources to attend proprietary schools, but she may move on to the appropriations committee, leaving her spot as chair open. Senator Sanders looks like he will take over. Uh, you know, we all know who he is. He's certainly no friend of our sector. He's he's no friend of business generally, and he will be somebody that will be very difficult to to work with on our issues and just on business issues generally. So that's that's what we're looking at in the Senate. And in the House, uh, the Republicans will have control. It's gonna be by a very slim margin. Remains to be seen who the speaker is going to be. I came in with Kevin McCarthy in 2006. We were classmates in that election and I know him very well. And he has been positioning for this moment his entire life, not just his political career, but his, his life since he was 15 years old and uh, did all the right things as far as fundraising and traveling around and positioning himself and, and winning the support of the, the current membership. 
but I think that margin is so thin that he's going to have trouble. And you saw Matt Gates came out and said he's not going to support McCarthy and he's going to round up votes. And if it's a three, four, five seat majority, uh, man, it's going to be hard for him to to get to be speaker. Right. And if he does become speaker, it will be because he he made deals with that faction within his party, which means he will, in, in a way that Paul Ryan and John Boehner did not, he will be a little bit more um, accommodating to their points of view. So, I, I, you know, we'll see what happens. But either way, the leverage, and you're seeing this on K Street now. It's interesting. One of my favorite things to watch after elections is where the staff and the people move. Because there, there's this shuffle that exists. All the people, uh, you know, in, in the lobbying community, a lot of them go back to the Hill. They move to different firms because based upon who won and who their relationships are, they become more or less valuable in, in the, the new Congress. And staff on the Hill, same deal. The ones who work for the most powerful members, some of them stay, but a lot of them go downtown and, and make a lot of money and cash in on those relationships. So you can read the tea leaves on what the next Congress is going to look like based upon who's going where. And the interesting thing is a lot of these lobbying firms in downtown D.C. are staffing up on people who are closely aligned and have strong relationships with the more extreme elements in the Republican Party, the Freedom Caucus types. And, and you know the names, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates, and looks like Congresswoman Boebert's going to survive her election. And this is uh, one of the things that is worth watching because we're, we're happy to see a change in leadership on the higher education committee. It looks like it's going to be Virginia Fox again, strong supporter of our sector, proprietary education, good friend of, of many of our schools, has toured all over the country. Our schools, a lot of people on this call have probably met her and, and maybe even had her to their schools. Uh, couldn't be more well situated if she were to become the chair. But if the majority is so thin and, and the power rests with the more extreme element of the party, they're not going to focus on higher education issues. They're going to focus on the, you know, the hot button extreme issues. And, you know, the, they'll be talking about, as it relates to higher, not higher ed, they're going to be talking about Title IX and transgender swimmers and, and things like that. And I, and I think that's, that's unfortunate because we have a lot of big issues we'd like to see resolved. We'd like to see the Higher Education Act reopened for the first time since 2008. We have a lot of things we could work with, but it's going to be difficult to get anything done over the over the next two years. Yeah. And one of the questions I see has just come in, asked if I think President Biden is going to run for re-election. Of course, uh, nobody but him knows the answer to that question. I suspect that he will. Now, like anyone who has known President Biden for a long time, I've known him since 2006, but uh, you know, he's he's clearly not the same as he was before. He is older. He's, he's different. He speaks in, in a more deliberative and halting way. But I, I, I tell you what, as somebody who has studied American history and just thinking about the way he will be portrayed in history, you know, whether you like his policies or not, you cannot deny the success that he has had. You look at this this last election, historically successful election given the circumstances. And then you, you know, you, you look at the unemployment rate and the, the negatives, the things that should have hurt him at the ballot box and the fact that they were successful and uh, the legislative successes that he's had. And, you know, you can argue, uh, has, has that been the driver of inflation, the big spending stimulus plans and the infrastructure, $2 trillion? Um, there is a political debate to be had, but that's his agenda. And when the historians look back at presidents and successful presidents, they, the question is, were they successful in driving their agenda? When they look at Lyndon Johnson, uh, he was very successful in driving his domestic agenda. Vietnam, different story with him. But the point with President Biden is it's kind of the same deal. There are detractors on the type of policies he's putting forward. There's a difference of opinion on the economic consequences of his priorities and the legislation that he's pursuing, but he's been able to get it done in a very difficult environment. So I don't see why he would step back at this point, because I'm sure he feels good physically about what he's, you know, what he's doing and his, his physical ability to do the job. And, uh, you know, 
barring some sort of, of change in, in that aspect of things, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't run again. And he should be even more emboldened to run again, given what happened on Tuesday, last Tuesday. So I uh, I don't have any knowledge of anybody, uh, any more than anybody else, but I do suspect he will run again. And that makes a lot of sense. And you're the uh, expert, not me. I mean, I would almost say the results from last week going back, I think you touched on the 60 or, year, 60 or 80 years is almost unprecedented with the economy, economic situation he's facing to avoid a dramatic shift away from the executive, the party that's in the presidency is nearly unprecedented back prior to World War II even. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, th th there's a question I see in the chat now about the strategy that Democrats took in the primaries to promote the weaker Republican candidates. And I'll just say, I personally was very active in opposing this. I, I was very public. I, I wrote, you know, signed public letters in opposition to the Democrats' effort to promote the weaker candidates, to intervene in Republican primaries, to spend money in support of folks who were clearly politically the weaker candidates. Uh, so I was not for that strategy, but uh, you know, because I argued a couple of things. One is it's just ethically wrong to intervene in, in the other primary, but also it's risky because were it to turn out to be a wave election, as some were predicting, and you put some of these folks forward, they could get swept in and they could win. And then, you know, you have these election deniers and people that Democrats would just really be opposed to, you know, their points of view, and they would be responsible for those folks holding public office. But that's not the way it turned out. The way it turned out is the Democrats won across the board and in every race where they did intervene, Pennsylvania being one of them with the Senate race, and they supported the weaker candidate because they felt like they would be easier to beat in the general election, uh, it worked. So uh, whether we like that strategy or not, if two years from now, President Trump is still out there and, and a part of things, and there are candidates that are aligning themselves with his brand. I think in primaries, you will absolutely see Democrats promoting those candidates because it's been shown those candidates cannot win in the general election. They're not going to win. And if they put forward another slate like that, I think, I think you'll see the Democrats, again, be emboldened by the result from last Tuesday. So I don't I don't like the idea that that's the game that they play, but I can see why they do it because it is very clear that those type of candidates can't win. And if your goal is to win the election, uh, you know, why not? Why not try to help the, the candidate that you know you can beat? Yeah, unfortunately, it was. You can certainly argue it was effective. Um, so it could encourage it again in the future. And as a resident of Pennsylvania outside of Pittsburgh, we certainly saw the impact of the Fetterman Oz. Uh, race and the spending for advertising here and um you know the, the method that, that both parties use which is just you know straight negative campaigning pretty pretty much on both sides i i think in pennsylvania it's pretty clear mccormick would have won uh, mccormick was the alternative to dr oz in the republican primary very successful businessman he played you know the conservative game in the primary because he was trying to win but i have no doubt he would have moderated himself and done it in a more credible way than oz in the general election and uh, uh you know just the way that race played out unfortunately as we all know senator let fetterman had some health issues significant health issues and i, I just think mccormick would have would have probably won a substantial margin in that race and the same is true in other states. Had they nominated a different candidate in Georgia and in Arizona and in Nevada, uh, they probably would have won those seats too. Um, so there's a question about what will the Democrats in the Senate do because they're going to continue the majority and maybe expand the majority and what kind of regulatory issues uh, are going to affect proprietary schools. So of course, regulatory issues flow through the administration. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the legislative issues are mostly about excluding our schools. And we've been extraordinarily successful, given the political climate of Democrats controlling everything over the past two years, of winning the legislative fights. 
they tried to exclude our students from everything that they did. Short-term Pell Grants, the expansion of the Pell Grant, existing Pell Grant program, COVID relief funding, any type of new programmatic funding that they were pursuing. It started by excluding students at for-profit schools. And we were able to win every fight. We won every single one of them. And uh, we did that because we were able to build coalitions. We found friends in the Democratic Party, uh, other uh, employers and associations that benefit from our graduates and, and see the great work that the schools do in educating the future workforce of America. We built those coalitions and we won those fights. So that's what we're going to see in the Senate. I think it's going to be more about excluding our students from, from any type of new programs and, and accountability. And, and we argue at CQ, we are not opposed to accountability. We are for um, holding schools accountable for their outcomes. We are for protecting students uh, in their educational pursuits. We just want to apply the rules to all schools in all sectors. We don't think that's an unreasonable position. Just apply the same rules to all types of schools. Why, should, why shouldn't all students have the same protections? Why shouldn't all schools be held accountable to the same outcomes? And of course, the folks on the other side, generally on the Democratic side, understand that if we were to do that, then some of their politically favored institutions would have a difficult time meeting those accountability standards. And you know, we get asked all the time, you know, what, 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 what are you afraid of, right? If Because we, we talk about our outcomes, we're proud of our graduation rates, our job placement rates, and we produce more than half the truck drivers and quarter of the nurses and welders and 40% of the aviation technicians, almost all the underwater construction divers, people that this country is gonna need moving forward. And they'll say, well, what, what, are you, what are you worried about then? If you have such great outcomes, what are you worried about the accountability? And I say, well, we're, we're worried about the same thing that you would be worried about if all the schools had to comply with the same accountability standards that you're trying to push upon us because they're not structured in a fair way. They're weaponized, the tools of the Department of Education in a way that make it more difficult and punish our schools and our students. And if they were to apply those same rules to all schools, uh, well, for example, on gainful employment, uh, the Obama era gainful employment regulations course famously only applied to for-profit schools and uh, career certificate programs at non-degree programs at uh, other schools. And so the vast majority of the schools that had to, you know, were targeted by that were for-profit schools. So the Texas Public Policy Foundation did a study last year, this year, earlier this year, that said if the Obama era rules applied to everybody, if all schools in all sectors had to comply with those gainful employment regulations, 89% of the schools that would have failed were outside the for-profit sector. They were either public or private nonprofit schools. So, you know, we, we've, we're not afraid of accountability. We just say apply the same rules to everybody. And if you do that, you're gonna force them to take a more thoughtful look in what they're doing, rather than just weaponizing them in a way that's clearly designed to put out of business this type of schools that they just have an ideological opposition to. So on the regulatory side, that's what we're going to have to deal with the next two years. That has not changed in the election, but that's what will be at stake in the next presidential election. So on the Senate side, there's not much involvement they will have on the regulatory side other than you know, they're not going to be doing the same type of asking the same type of questions and investigations that the House will be engaging. And we've been pretty successful in getting those questions asked in the current environment. So we feel with the change in the House leadership, we can get some of these questions asked about outcomes and accountability and why doesn't apply to all schools and what was the motivation in structuring things in certain ways. And uh, I think from that perspective, we'll have a stronger hand. I think I found, and you might have been the source for this, where it's a difficult um, hurdle to overcome in that um, the leaders and, and members of Congress, when they see the proprietary schools in their district, they recognize all the value they bring to people in their area, the learning a skill to go get a job and really be able to change their, their life. But they, they almost envision a difference. Well, their school is the exception compared to the schools in, in the rest of the country. And it's a difficult hurdle in that locally 
they each individually see the value being brought to their section, but it's how do you translate that that value to recognizing that it is the majority of the schools providing that that value to them. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And uh, more generally, I talked about the transportation infrastructure bill, right? If, if you're, you know, we're, we saw in COVID, 43% of the respiratory therapists in the country that were dealing on the front lines with COVID every day, those were our graduates, 43% of them. Um, in healthcare, you know, we all understand nurses, the allied health professions, phlebotomists, medical assistants, dental assistants, all of those roles, uh, we, we provide a large portion of the workforce. And when you look at the infrastructure bill that was passed, $2 trillion, you're going to spend $2 trillion rebuilding America. Roads and bridges, ports, locks and dams, airports. Um, it's worthwhile to do that. And uh, that work needs to get done by somebody. Where are those workers going to come from? Those, I'll tell you where they're going to come from. Those are our graduates. They're going to come from our schools. Those, those cons underwater construction divers, welders, truck drivers, HVACs, uh, auto and aviation technicians, all the things I talked about, those are our graduates. So on one hand, they're trying to put our schools out of business. And on the other hand, they're spending more money in ways that are going to necessitate students and graduates from our schools doing the work that they're trying to pass. So it just, it doesn't make any, any sense. And I see one of the questions is on the use of the appropriations process to withhold funding for implementation of regulations we don't like. That is really difficult to do in what's going to be the current environment, which is a couple handful seat majority in the House and then the Democratic Senate and a Democratic president. So the only way that would work is if you could get all of that through the process and have the president sign it into law. The House cannot unilaterally withhold funding from an agency. So in theory, could the Congress, if signed by the president, withhold funding for those? Yes, they could. Um, it would be difficult with, with regard to 90-10 and, and borrower defense and gainful employment coming up because those don't really take much funding to implement. You know, I guess you need somebody to look at the numbers and review the data, but um, it would be harder to use that tactic on those type of regulations. But so in theory, you, you could, but in practice, no, not in this environment, because it would have to get through the Senate, which it won't, and it would have to be signed by President Biden, which clearly it won't. So that's not a tactic we're going to be able to pursue. We know that um, you know education certainly wasn't in, in most races a high priority item that was often discussed, but with the lack of the red wave coming in um, and the result of the of the recent elections, do you think it reinforces priorities of the current administration? Does it change the priorities or adjust those in any way? As a result, this is what's interesting. If you look at the Virginia governor's race from last year, so 2021, first year President Biden, Virginia, of course, holds their governor's race in the off year. So it's always the first test of a new president is that Virginia governor's race. And uh, Governor Youngkin won by running on an educational platform. He, he ran not as a Trump Republican, he ran as a you know thoughtful kind of more moderate business oriented Republican, but his main issue was parental control of education. So not necessarily higher education, but just the idea that the politicians have gotten too involved in education and the parents and the local communities should have more involvement in the decision making of how to proceed on, on education. And that was very successful. He beat Terry McAuliffe, who had been a, a prior governor of Virginia and a very strong candidate and is now on a, himself a national candidate. I was, you know, he, he, he would be a great presidential candidate. But again, if he were to throw his name in with DeSantis and, and dilute the vote, then you're going to end up with Trump again. So they're going to have to figure that part out. But leaving that aside, uh, Governor Youngkin proved that you can win by talking about those type of issues. And it was lost in the current environment because it became all about the, you know, the polarizing hot button issues. And I do think there is a path for candidates to talk more about 
higher education. And I don't, you know, I, I'm not naive that they're going to go out and, and campaign affirmatively for proprietary education or that we are going to be the focus of, of that. But I think there's a larger issue of accountability in higher education and some pretty high profile mistakes that have been made by other types of institutions. Uh, you know, you look at Temple and Rutgers and you know, some of the other schools that have had issues and certainly on the nonprofit side as well. And, you know, we, we don't like to go around and talk about that and point fingers. All we say is uh, just, just hold everybody accountable to the same rules. And we, you know, we have a podcast uh, at uh, CQ and, you know, hopefully you, if you're interested, listen to it. We have a lot of good guests on there. And one of our upcoming guests is going to be a really interesting episode is uh, going to be from the uh, Arnold Ventures, you know, the John and Laura Arnold Foundation. And they are the foundation that funds all of these groups, they're the top funder for all of these groups that oppose our sector. So TICUS and the Century Foundation and, and Veterans Education Success and Third Way, you know, all these groups that continually come out with these anti-sector studies and information, those are all funded by Arnold Ventures. And we're going to have a conversation about what, what, what's your interest? You know, why, why are you so focused on for-profit education? And what you find is this is the interesting part. They will say they're not necessarily focused on for-profit education, but they believe the majority of the problem is in the for-profit education. And we talk about the fact that we do not believe that is true. And when you look at the percentage of higher education, and as I said, 89% of the failures in, in GE would have been in other sectors, um, there's no reason to allow other schools to get off the hook on accountability measures. And, what makes it really difficult to push back on that now is that we have the data to support these arguments that we're making. So it used to be uh, they would just say, well, the for-profits are, are the problem. And, you know, the college scorecard didn't exist and there was no way to you know, push back on that. Well, now you can very easily at a moment's notice, click, click of the mouse, compare schools, any type of schools that you want. Look at any school, look at their outcomes look at their debt load, uh, you will find that for-profit schools compared to private nonprofits and for-profit schools have the lowest median debt. Our graduates have the lowest median debt compared to other sectors. Our graduation rate is above the national average, it's higher than private nonprofits, and it's double community college graduation rates. So you, know, you can look at individual schools. So it's really hard to sit back if you're somebody that cares about higher education and purports to be interested in outcomes and holding schools accountable to sit back and say, well, you know, for profits are the entire problem because the data shows that we're not and there are big problems. So I think you'll you'll like that episode because th that that's going to be a good conversation. That'd be but interesting. That's the argument. Yeah, interesting for sure. And, you know, hopefully finding the right metrics and we're advocates, we work with a significant number of financial aid departments. And so you know, across all spaces and unfairly, I feel like they're feeling the burden of everything that is coming up. So um, managed all of the, the support and the grants and making sure it was going out to their students was being paid correctly, the, the ever changing regulations. And so you're know, coming up with metrics that are the right metrics and some that are uh, hopefully, um, you know, a little bit uh, easily attainable or reportable um, and working with to find what those right metrics would be. We would be behind for sure. There's a study um, or there's a question in the chat that says, are there funded studies that support proprietary education? And similar to what I just said, there was that Texas Public Policy Foundation study that showed only 11% of the failures in GE would have been in the for-profit sector. And we started this year at CQ uh, a foundation, a 501c3 foundation, which is a subsidiary of CQ. And it's called CQ Education, it's the CQ Research Foundation. And the point of it is to, uh, to go out and request funding from funders to support research not necessarily that supports proprietary education, but that takes a fair look at the issues. A lot of those groups I mentioned before, they do not take a fair look. They skew the data. They, they purport 
the results to be what they are not. And we felt like there needed to be a way to support research from credible organizations that takes a fair look. You can't guarantee the outcome of what it's going to show, but we're pretty confident if you look at some of those measures I mentioned, you're, you're going to show um, the outcomes in a different way than I think most people in the public would view them, who you know, have heard from these other groups. So through our research foundation, we have been able to fund some studies. Now, it's not helpful to, to the cause to say exactly which studies those were or where the funding come from, because if, if it's known that the funding came from us, then there are some that would view that as discrediting the results of the study. Now, we don't, we don't skew the results. We don't demand that the study show certain things in advance. We just say this is an issue that we think should be looked at, and we're pretty confident if you do look at it, it's going to come out favorable. So that Texas Public Policy Foundation study came out. There was another one from a, a very prominent researcher named Preston Cooper that also looked at GE and recommended that the rules should apply to all schools and all sectors. I'm hearing that there's going to be an urban foundation report, which is generally considered to be a more democratic or you know, progressive leaning organization. Um, they're going to come out with, with something on GE soon, uh, I'm hearing. But you know, we don't talk publicly about the studies that we have funded in particular, because again, you know, that's not necessarily helpful to the study itself. But uh, we are out there and there are more credible studies that are coming out today in, in recent months than has been in the past. And you're going to see a lot more of them. If we look out over the next, let's say, 12 to 24 months, it seems to me that you're the expert that uh, it's not going to be really legislative changes. It's going to be the continuation of negotiated rulemaking, going through the NPRM process for um, the, the negotiated rulemaking issues that came up in the fourth quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of this year. Is that a fair statement of those are going to be the most important changes and, and you know, likely to be um, include some new attacks on proprietary schools that you see? It is absolutely fair and it's, it's the truth that the regulatory side are, are where the threats are going to come from. We just saw implementation of a new 9010 rule. The 9010 rule that was just implemented was a consensus agreement that included our sector, and CQ largely drove that compromise. And the reason we were able to do that is because they tried to push through in March of 2021 through the Democratic controlled Congress a very poorly drafted bill on 9010 that would have included every possible source of federal funding that you can think of and it would have taken effect immediately upon enactment which would have been march of 2021 without any opportunity to plan and it would have literally put a number of our schools out of business because they wouldn't have been able to comply with immediate enactment we were able to push back on that change the bill to force it through negotiated rulemaking, delay the process, make it a more thoughtful, deliberative, compromising process. And as a result, we were able to compromise on some pretty important issues in negotiated rulemaking. For example, they proposed on the administration side that state matching funds should count towards your 90-10, right? Should count as federal funding, even though they're state matching funds. Um, clearly, it's ludicrous, but that would not, we were not going to be able to change that unless we had the compromise. Uh, to, the money that is spent on tuition, of course, counts for 9010, but the money spent on things like housing uh, would have been counted under the previous attempt at 9010. We were able to negotiate that out. So things like uh, housing allowance for students not counted as, as tuition funding. And uh, there was compromise made regarding on-the-job training, uh, educational opportunities that occur off-site, off of campus. Very important part of a career education, you know, getting out onto the work site and, and being able to apply your trade uh, uh, in, in, in the workplace setting. Uh, we were able to negotiate a compromise regarding that. So we did not oppose the 90-10 rule, given the political climate, right? It was going to happen. They were going to add the veteran and Department of Defense funding to 
90-10. That was going to happen either way. But we were pretty successful in being able to get the most egregious things out of that 90-10. So that is now implemented, takes effect the beginning of the academic year. Now, July 1st is going to be the implementation of the borrower defense rule, which also just came. Now, this is a different story. We, we were not able to convince we did get a few things we, you know, through what we did, 137 page comment letter made some pretty persuasive legal arguments on why they were wrong on some things. And they they did moderate it a little bit by um, it, it, it's open to interpretation, but they they looked at things like the student having to show harm um, as part of their claim, which is a huge part of this whole thing, of course. But it still is a group process rather than an individual process so you you know you adjudicate all of these claims in mass not individually so you don't look at the individual merits necessarily of every case uh, the retroactivity part we were able to negotiate that out so we were we were happy with that but um, still not by any stretch a, a good outcome for our sector and and, and GE is a battle to come and it, it's very important, but borrower defense is the biggest issue that could threaten our schools because it's so open ended, it's so open to interpretation. You have enterprising lawyers and consumer groups that go around the country and approach graduates of for profit schools, many of whom have had a fine educational experience. They have jobs, they, they, they like what happened, they would never think twice about it, but somebody comes up to them and puts a piece of paper in front of them and says, Hey, you want to get your loan repaid? sign this, we're going to do a borrower defense, you know, group group filing. And uh, they, they find two, three hundred, a thousand, depending on the size of the school, graduates who say, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll get my loan repaid. And then now you look at all those thousand claims as a group, not as individual claims. Uh, you can see the problem there. There is language uh, just inexplicably that if the department does not make a decision in three years on a borrower defense claim, it is presumed to be true and the loan is forgiven for the student. Now, the school is not held accountable for that uh, in, in that aspect, the three years, but there's reputational damage that can occur to a school when, when you have that. So they've created a system that incentivizes a flood of new BDR claims you're going to have people out there ginning that up. And then they've put a time stamp in there that if they can't move within three years, which they, of course, can't possibly move in, in that time frame, then they're all just presumed to be true and, and the loan is forgiven. So, you know, a lot of big problems with that. That's going to take effect July 1st. I think we all understand the significance of borrower defense and how important that issue is. So what I would say is for this public audience, we are exploring all options related to that. And uh, we feel that they have violated the law in the way they have pursued this in a number of ways. Not the, 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 the most significant is we just feel there's agency overreach. They've exceeded their authority at the department to do this. And you see that the student loan repayment generally is on pause. There was a case involving West Virginia and the Environmental Protection Agency that made similar arguments that the Supreme Court ruled in favor of West Virginia. We feel like we're on pretty solid legal ground. So I, I will just say, and there's many, many other issues that we feel they've, they've overstepped their, their legal authority. So if you are interested in learning more about that aspect of things, about what the response to the of the sector is going to be on borrower defense, please get in touch with me directly and we will tell you about that. I think you'll be seeing quite a bit more from us as it relates to what I just described. I don't wanna to get too into the weeds in this setting, but please contact me directly if you're interested in getting involved in helping that process because that's gonna involve resources and that's gonna involve probably a lengthy process of pushing back and fighting back in a way that uh, I, think, I think you all understand what I'm saying. Well, it seems to me too, one of the big changes was the elimination of the partials relief and i've heard both sides of that one is um, it makes it a higher hurdle to prove that it it would require full relief or not but also that it can be much easier that if you see any harm that you just declare that all the loan should be forgiven for 
a class until you see how it gets enacted and enforced. It's difficult to interpret the language and, and what it means. Um, I would step in now. We did talk about some of the, the rules that have been released and just to help this, this audience uh, related to 9010 that we are still working to um, understand some of the nuances and the and the changes and to make sure that we understand it and uh, as a firm or in some contact with the department as well just to make sure that we understand the way they are intending uh, the various fund sources to be applied and and the order and certainly as we have more information about that we'll be sharing it with the sector overall for sure and let me just say how how we win on, on these arguments right what what is the most effective way to put forward to make our case right to put forward our arguments and without question i think we all know this it's to get legislators decision makers policy makers to our schools so they can see firsthand the incredible impact that we have on students who might otherwise not have an opportunity in higher education and i spend a lot of my time traveling around the country visiting schools i've been all over the place i'm going to Wyoming this weekend for a ribbon cutting of a 90,000 square foot new, um, you know, for the blue collar trades at, at WyoTech. I'm speaking in California the week after that. And I, you know, I, I, I've been, I visited schools all over the country. And I can just tell you, there is nothing more inspirational than seeing the faces of those students. And I have brought members of Congress, I've brought regulators from the state and federal level to, to these visits. And it does change their their mentality for that moment. You know, the problem is then they leave and they go back into their bubble and they have the same political pressures and you know that they don't always act upon it in the way that you would like. But you can see their face. When you're looking at single moms, veterans returning to the workforce, people going through transition in life, difficult circumstances, maybe downsized in their job, going through a divorce, and they need, they're working two jobs in addition to their study and, and they've got a kid at home and you know they, they need the after hours and they're coming straight from work and you know the the flexibility and expediency that our schools provide that other settings don't in a high quality educational experience and then getting them jobs placed in the workforce making a difference in their life there is nothing more inspirational than seeing that. You know, I, I've spoken at these graduation ceremonies and you see the family and the friends of, of these folks, or you know, sometimes you don't, there, there's nobody, right? Because it's just them and they're out there and, and it's just as inspirational and you can see their face and the pride and you just know the difference that they're making for our communities because you heard me list them off earlier. These are people that we rely on every day. These are occupations that are important to society. And I would add, I didn't list, but you know, cosmetology and culinary and beauty and wellness, and you know, on top of the blue collar trades and the healthcare professions, all of these are people that we see every day around us. And many of these policymakers don't take a step back and think, well, where do these people come from? How do they get into these jobs? What's their life circumstances that led them to this opportunity? And so what I would suggest to everybody is do what you can to get legislators in your schools and, and get an audience with them and be active and engaged. Don't be afraid to request a meeting and go in and see them in their district office. You don't have to go travel to Washington, go see them. If you're in Pittsburgh or Houston or Seattle or Denver, wherever you are, um, you know, they have district offices, make an appointment during the recess and just sit down and talk to them and explain the work that you do and how important it is and provide examples. Cause I can tell you when you see those students and you hear their life stories and you know the challenges that they faced and, and the opportunity they now have that otherwise would have escaped them. That's awe-inspiring and you really can make a difference. So for those of you that are out there and you're wondering, well, what can I do? How can I make a difference? I think that's the way it is, is talk about it. And if you can bring a student that's willing to talk, you know, a non-traditional student with a good story, uh, as many of them are, Bring it with you. That's great. It really does make a difference. It makes an impact. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I, I talk many times. My my favorite gatherings during the year are always with the uh, various financial aid administrators groups across the country. And the energy 
they bring and the support they provide to their students. And we get a brief look when we do some of our auditing and I've reviewed hundreds if not thousands of student files. And while we don't get a chance to meet them, you read their story in there and see professional judgment and other things and the way these offices have created opportunity for people that otherwise did not have an opportunity and were able to individually step up and take advantage of what was presented to them and really change their life. And you just are energized by seeing that happen for sure. Yeah. So much that they do. So I, I would just say as we get to the close here that you know, the political climate, as we saw, is not going to change. We are a polarized nation politically. I, I can give you a totally different speech, something I talk a lot about, about uh, most people are not polarized. Most people want a functioning government and people who can work together. And uh, the reason we have people representing the extremes in Congress is because our election system through closed primaries and so forth is designed to incentivize the extremes and empowers them. So I give you a different speech on that. But the fact is the people representing us in Congress uh, for the next two years, it looks like the dynamic is going to be approximately the same as it has been. We are going to have a backstop in the House where we won't have Chairman Scott pushing through legislation to harm us uh, regularly as he tried to do. But we are going to have an adversarial environment in the Senate. We're going to have a regulatory challenge, especially with GE coming up. But we're going to have all that debate and uh, BDR being implemented now. And I told you there uh, may be a, a legal uh, you know, dispute uh, related to that, which, you know, get in touch with me if you're interested, but it's going to be, it's going to be a tough few years here. And, and uh, the political climate is going to continue to be adversarial for our sector. And as I said, you keep doing what you're doing and, and showing good outcomes. And that that's how we win this debate, but it's, it's not going to change in Washington. It's it's something that the Democrats are passionate about. They're going to continue to pursue policies adversarial to our interests. And we do have some friends in the Democratic Party. We have a lot of friends on the Republican side. And we're going to push back in a way I think we're going to see some success. But just from a, you know, kind of a process perspective over the next two years, I wouldn't expect it to look a whole lot different than the past two years looked because um, we're divided, you know, it's, it's, it's equal. And yeah, the Republicans are gonna have a three or four seat majority instead of the Democrats having a five seat majority out of 435 seats. And I think that's probably the way it's gonna go back and forth in, in years to come. It's, it's not gonna be one of these deals where one party holds control for 40 years, the, the way that it used to be. And uh, we will continue to work within the environment that we are given, uh, do the best we can to, influence and engage and, and be involved in the process. But we can't do that without your support and the work that you do. So just understand that just by being out there, by making a difference, by supporting and engaging schools and giving them the resources and the technologies that they need to be as efficient and, and uh, high quality as they can be, and for our schools themselves to be able to what put forward that high quality product and, and uh, pursue education, g give opportunities for students to pursue high quality education. That's how we win. That that's the answer. So um, really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today. And uh, any, anyone should feel free to get in touch with me directly if you have any questions about anything I said or if you're interested in getting more involved in any way. Yeah, Jason, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights with us. Very helpful. And for all the work that you do for higher education and proprietary schools in particular, and certainly supporting those institutions so that they can support their, their students. And, you know, at McClinic and Associates, that's really what our vision is. We want to help institutions remain compliant with Title IV and the ever-changing regulations and try to limit the impact to you and the time that you need to spend so that you can focus on your students and how you're going to keep can keep changing lives their lives um, as we do wrap up again thank you everybody who made time to join us today just to note you will be receiving uh, an email with a recording of today's webinar that can be viewed and or shared um, if you're not already we certainly direct you to our website to sign up for our mcclinic minute for insights for the ever changes to title four regulations and the impact 
it could have for all schools. Um, I, I promise you that we uh, limit it to the most impactful communication, so we will not be bombarding your inbox, inbox but hitting you with information when it's most necessary. Um, and with that, thank you everybody for joining us today. Jason, thank you for your, your time and your insights. We definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Happy to do it. Thanks.